you got to peel it, right? Because oranges are a little bit different. What about an apple? Do you peel an apple? You just bite into it. Well, somebody might peel an apple, but you pick it off the tree. There you go. Have you ever picked an orange off a tree? No, not here in Michigan. So oranges have rinds and apples have cores, so you have to eat them differently. One you peel and the other you core. The same is true of books. If a story starts with the phrase, once upon a time, then you know it's a fairy tale and you don't read it like a history book. The Bible is no different. If you're going to understand the Bible, you need to know the kinds of literature it contains. Then you can read them each in the right way. These different kinds or styles are called genres, but why couldn't God just have given us a book with all the same style? Well, Scripture contains many genres in order to help you, all of you, you have feelings. So there are parts of his word, for example, the poetry of Psalms that speak to your heart. You have thoughts, so there are letters like Romans that stretch your mind. You make choices, so there are Bible commands that challenge your obedience. Most of all, we learn from stories, so the Bible tells us lots of stories. One true story about Jesus rescuing the world from death and evil. God's word speaks personally to every part of your life. Here's a basic list of the genres in the Bible. First, we have history. You see all those books up there in the history section? It's the one on the left. There's a lot of them in there. The entire Bible is historically true, and about one half of the Old Testament focus on, focuses on retelling historical events. They recount what God has done for his people. He made them, loves them, leads them, forgives them, etc. None of his people deserves any of his kindness. All of his people, even the best of the kings, are filled with weakness and often fail. This means that the hero of these stories is God himself. And the Old Testament tells us how one day God will send the perfect king to rescue his flawed and failing people. Then we have the next genre, the law. Right in the middle of the stories, God tells his people how he wants them to live. He is their authority. As their true king, God gives them rules that show what he loves and what he hates. Can you come, have, can you come sit down? Can you come sit down, Madeline? Yeah, can you go sit down too, Joe? So after the law, we have poetry. Over one-third of the Bible is poetry. Instead of having rhyming sounds, poems in the Bible have rhyming ideas that combine to make one beautiful point. For example, the first line of Psalm 9, verse 9 says, The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed. The second line of this poem matches and builds on the first. The Lord is a stronghold in times of trouble. The biblical authors wrote in this kind of poetry to express their feelings to God, sometimes in songs sad or happy, but always from the heart. God has promised to set everything right one day, and that promise puts every song into the key of hope. Then we have books of wisdom. A handful of the Old Testament books teach how to live skillfully before God in this wonderful, painful, and complicated world. These books, like Proverbs, often recognize that life usually follows certain God-created patterns. For example, if you do wrong, you will usually get caught. They also remind us that wisdom comes from trusting God. None of us can do that perfectly, and that's why God would eventually send the wisest man ever who always trusted God with his whole heart. Then we have the prophecy. These books mostly record the sermons of the prophets God sent to deliver his messages to his sinful people. That's what we'll be looking at this morning is prophecy. Sometimes the prophets spoke about what God would do in the future, and sometimes they would simply preach to God's people. In these messages, the prophets encouraged God's people by reminding them that God still loved them. The prophets also warned God's people to forsake their sin and turn back to God. If they refused, bad things would happen. In light of all this sin, one day God would send the perfect person who would do for God's people what they never could do, obey and love God perfectly. Then we have the Gospels. Do you guys know, are there two different sections in the Bible? 
the New Testament. That's right. In the beginning of the New Testament, we have the Gospels. And we start with the four Gospels. What are the four Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. That's right. And this also lumps in Acts to that. So they feature eyewitness testimonies from people who are actually there. They record how Jesus set the perfect example and gave commands to be obeyed. Yet the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ lived and died, not merely as an example or a teacher, but as our substitute. He was the one for whom God's people had been waiting. Jesus lived the life we never could and died the death we should have died. The book of Acts follows the gospels and continues the story of Jesus, telling how the good news spread all over the world. After the gospels, we have the letters. The letters of the New Testament help explain the importance of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. What was the meaning of all God had done through Jesus? The truth in these letters help people, or God's people, deal with temptation, error, and suffering. And then we have apocalyptic literature. How many books are in that bottom right corner one, the red one? Do you see how many? Two. That's right. The first one in that book is, or in that corner is Daniel, and that's what we're talking about today. The second one is Revelation, or the Revelation of John, and they both kind of talk about some similar stuff, so maybe we'll do some comparison when we're talking today. But in this apocalyptic book, this kind of book, it's not always easy to understand the details of what will happen in the future. The writing is often mysterious, but what's crystal clear is that no matter how bad things get, no matter how much the world hates God and it hates God and his people, Jesus will triumph. The story of the Bible and the story of the world will have a happy ending. Remember, sometimes you'll find several genres in the same book of the Bible. So, let's say a word of prayer, and then we can all go back to our seats, all right? God, we thank you for these children, this blessing that uh, we have, and I pray that as a church we would raise them up to know you, that we wouldn't forsake them, but that we would continually speak life into them and, and speak your word to them, that they would come to know and, and serve you, God. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go have a seat. Thanks for coming. Come on, Joe. All right, now you can open up to Daniel chapter 12. That's where we'll be starting this morning, if you didn't pick up on that already. So, if you've got your Bibles there, um, first I'd like to do a quick recap of what we talked about last week, for anybody who wasn't here last week, uh, because at this point we are in the middle of a book, or the middle of a chapter at the end of the book, and we just kind of started there. And so a quick recap of how we got there helps put in context exactly what's happening. So we, we are in this chapter 12 of Daniel, and he's having a vision. This vision actually starts back in chapter 10, um, but we're just continuing on to, to chapter 12 and looking at it at that point. In, at this point in Daniel's life, he's actually quite an old man, um, nearing actually his, his eventual death. And he has this vision of all these things that, that we talk about in the, other, in the other chapters. But he's already gone through so many different things in his life. He's gone through uh, a lion's den. He's interpreted dreams for a king. He's, his friends were thrown in a fiery furnace. And those are just a couple of the examples that we actually have in the book of Daniel. And all this time, he is an Israelite in captivity in Babylon. So he's not at home. He's not where he desires to be. He has this constant want for his people eventually to be returned to Israel. And we read about that through the book. And so last week when we talked, we, we kind of weaved through this, this vision in chapter 12. And we looked at the first four verses and stopped for a second to emphasize specifically verse 3. Let me, just, let me just read that to you guys real quick. And, and it was already read this morning, but it says, 
those in chapter 12, verse 3, says, Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. In this verse, it cascaded us down a path of questioning how would Daniel actually interpret this. This, is, this was kind of a mystery because leading others to righteousness wasn't a thing at that time. There was this, this subtle piece that, th- that w- this angel had, had slipped in there, and it didn't really line up with what was known of the Old Testament law. But leading to other, peop- other peoples to righteousness what is, it, is what eventually we would see in the New Testament in the future, and what this angel was foretelling would actually come. As we know, there were no Israelite missionaries. That, that wasn't a thing. But today, we send people out all over the world in order to lead others to righteousness. And so this angel comes in and subtly throws this in, kind of flipping all of this understanding that the Israelites had right on its head, but pointing directly to the future and what we would someday come to know as we see Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and ultimately what that brought to us in behalf of, of our redemption to be able to come before God, even as Gentiles. And so with that recap, let's, let's say a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll dive into the next part of the book of Daniel. God, we thank you for this morning, this, this beautiful day that you've blessed us with. I pray that you would just give us wisdom, give us understanding as we look into this uh, prophetic book, looking at the future and, and and what you have in store for us. We thank you for these, these books that we can look and know that you know what's going to happen, that you are in control, and I pray that we would be able to rest in that, that we would be able to see your power and your control and, and find joy and peace in that and comfort in that. And I pray that uh, we would just lean on and, and seek you in everything that we do, and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, If you're in Daniel chapter 12, uh, we'll be starting at verse 5 this morning. And so we'll we'll read from there. It says, Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, How long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? Now this is talking about what he was just saying, what we talked about last week. And he's asking, how long before these things will be fulfilled? So because we're just jumping into the middle of this, let's, let's, let's grab who these, who these people are. We have this man on a river, man on the banks, what's going on here? And so as we see earlier, these are angels actually, uh, and they're the ones speaking in this context. They're asking these questions. Daniel, he actually doesn't speak nearly at all in these last chapters, only a handful of times. It's predominantly the angel who's floating over the waters, who's doing the majority of the speaking. But it it brings up this interesting situation because an angel is asking a question to another angel in a vision. And, And it kind of wrinkles my brain when I see that because why does an angel need to ask a question to another angel? Don't they just know? Like... They're all angels. What's the, what's the big deal? But he says, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? And so does this angel not know it, or is he simply posing this question so that we can have understanding of it, what actually is going on here? And it's something I've always wondered about, you know, how knowledge works in heaven. I, I don't have a clue in regards to it, but it's something that that I I like to ponder, and so you guys, as uh, we're going through, maybe can ponder on that throughout the week, how knowledge happens in heaven, because this angel is asking a question to another angel. But maybe more importantly, we have to look at the question that he's actually asking, how long before these things are fulfilled? And so within this piece, we see what we would call angelic prophecy, or maybe you could lump it just into biblical prophecy. Now, I know I I called these two sermons on Daniel righteousness and sacrifice, but I probably should have taken three weeks and done righteousness prophecy 
and sacrifice in hindsight. But because prophecy is such a huge piece of what's actually happening here, that the, the angels and, and where they're calling out and what they're doing is, is the, a giant piece of actually what's going on in Daniel. When I'm working with the youth group guys, I try to constantly reiter- reiterate this, this idea and concept of prophecy. Because the reality is, is when we read the Bible, there's one key thing that we can always look at to, to find validity within it, right? And, and that is prophecy. Someone saying what's going to happen in the future and then it actually happening. And we read through the Bible and see time after time after time after time. I think Jesus' life fulfilled 500 different prophecies that were called out to him. And, and within that, we have this validity that what was written down was true because it actually happened. Now, Daniel's kind of tough, right? Because it's the end of times. He could write whatever he wanted and you wouldn't know until the end of times, right? But, but we have the rest of the Bible that we can look at and say, okay, all of these things, we see this prophecy fulfilled. And now Daniel poses another prophetic thing and we lump it together within that because he was writing on behalf of, of God's will. And, and prophecy isn't the only reason we can look at the Bible as true, but the Bible does say in, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 21, it gives a, um, a litmus test maybe, or, or how do you know what a prophet says is actually legitimate? And it says pretty clearly in verse 21, you may say to yourselves, How can we know when a message has been spoken by the Lord? Then verse 22, if what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. Seems pretty straightforward. If, If it doesn't happen, God didn't say it. God can't lie. He's not going to prophesy something that isn't going to occur. And so we see here in Daniel this prophecy on behalf of God, from these angels, and we can say, okay, we're, we, can, we can have confidence in what is actually being said. But there's another reason, another thing that us as Christians hold on to on behalf of the legitimacy of what's actually happening here, that this is actually going to be fulfilled as the angel said. And that's by faith. As, as Christians, so much of what we do is strictly by faith. Our belief in God and the Bible will always, at its core, be built on faith. So if we believe, ultimately it's because of this faith that we have. But let's continue on in in the book and the chapter and see what the answer to this question actually is. In verse 7 it says, The man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river lifted his right hand and his left hand towards heaven, and I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, It will be for time, times, and half a time, when the power of the holy people has been finally broken, and all these things will be completed. So that cleared it all up for you guys, right? <laughs> we can all go home now. So, so the first thing, let's, let's break it down chunk by chunk maybe. The first thing we see here is the man raising his hands towards heaven. And, and this is actually an act we see consistently throughout the Bible. And it implies th- the act of an oath, saying what I'm saying is true. This, this thing I'm telling you, it's not made up. It's not, I'm raising my hands towards heaven on behalf saying, God told me this and I'm now presenting it to you and it's, it's true. This, this next part, we have, the, you know, the angel above the water saying, what I'm saying to you is true, and then he swears by God, actually, on behalf of it, and then it says, it will be for time, times, and half a time. Now, we actually see this multiple other places in the Bible. This isn't an unheard of of passage that we have, mostly in Daniel and Revelation, but it's commonly interpreted as three and a half years. We have time, which would be one year, times, which would be two years, and half a time, which would be half a year. So you have one plus two plus a half. Our math geniuses can put that together, and that's three and a half 
years that it's actually talking about. And commonly, we actually see that kind of smashed down into actually 1,260 days. Now, our calendars, that doesn't work out, so I don't know where 1,260 days came from. The, the Hebrew calendar, it must have come out that way. And we see th- that number of days actually called out. But three and a half years does have uh, some level of consistency, actually, within the Bible. If you look at Jesus' life, his ministry, where he walked and preached and talked, they say he lasted three and a half years. And if you look at later on in, in Revelation, we see this time, times, and half a time as well, talking about what we would call the, the Antichrist. And we see that his reign will be for three and a half years as well. But then there's something kind of, sh- I mean, not strange like the whole thing is. It, it gets even stranger at the end of this verse as we, as we continue on. It says, when the power of the holy people has been finally broken, all these things will be completed. And that, that's, that's, it's a little bit more difficult to, to tell you what's actually going on here. You, you remember from our, our sermon last week, we talked about your people in verse 3, or verse 1 of, uh, of Daniel. And, and we said your people were, were Christians, were, were the believers joined together. But we don't see your people here. We see of the holy people. And so most commentators and, and, and people who read this view and interpret this holy people actually as Israel. That was the holy people. That's God's chosen people. And so it specifically says the holy people has been finally broken. And many interpret that then as the, the holy people, the people of Israel, their time as a nation ultimately coming to an end. That, that Israel's power will finally be broken. That Israel will ultimately fall. And this is a sign of, of when all of these things will actually be completed. And then verse 8, it continues, I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked, my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? And that's one of the few places we actually see Daniel talking the, the angel replies, go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the end of time. Many will be purified, made spotless, and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. And the thing I love about this is Daniel doesn't get it. Right? So we can feel really good about ourselves when we read this and don't know what's going on. Because even Daniel was like, what's happening here? Can you explain this to me? Can you expound to me what you're talking about through all of this? And the angel responds, yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> we like it in the New Testament, right? Jesus tells a parable to someone and then goes off and explains to his disciples what that parable meant. And so we feel really smart because we're like, yeah, Jesus explained it. Obviously, this is what the parable meant. And all those people, how did they not get that the seeds being scattered over the rocks were the, you know, the sin in the world eating out the, the, the faith that was being tested? But Jesus explained it. That's why we get it. It's not our knowledge that's being written here. It's, it's Jesus. We don't actually get that. In the, book of the da- in the book of Daniel, the angel simply says, well, no, don't worry about it. Well, it, it'll all happen, and, and you don't need to, to have a problem with this. And, and on top of that, Daniel was viewed as a wise man, as we talked about before. He was the top-notch, intelligent guy. And he's still like, yeah, this, this doesn't make any sense to me. You're, you're not adding up with what you're talking about. But beyond that, we see Many will be purified, made spotless, and refined. And I think this is a reiteration of verse 3 and what we talked about a lot of last week, saying many will be purified. Because this passing of righteousness, this, this bringing others to righteousness is what we will be called to do. And, and in that act, many will be purified, made spotless, 
and refined. But ultimately, it says that the wicked will, will remain there. The wicked will refuse the truth. And only those who are wise will ultimately understand it. And as we saw before, being wise was what's called the fear of the Lord. And so those who are purified and refined will continue to fear the Lord. And then we come to almost the end of the chapter, the, the final piece of, of the book of Daniel. In verse 11, it starts, From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. Now, again, this is prophecy, and it's really hard to interpret. Uh, a lot of what I actually found online on behalf of this, and, and as I was going through it myself, it's like, yeah, these days don't make any sense, right? We had 1,260 days before, right? Times, time, and half a time. But now we have 1,290 days. So it's just 1,260 plus 30, or is, is it like time, times, and seven twelfths of a time? You know, what's, what's going on within that? And then on top of that, right after it, we see 1,335 days. So there's another 45 days on top of that as well. And this is viewed as, as one of the most difficult pieces to actually interpret because we want to say 1,260, 1,260, and 1,260, right? Like that, that makes sense to us. It's this long, so if you survive for that long, everything is, is good to go. But it doesn't. It, it adds out. People have different theories about the, the lengths and the numbers and the number one means this and three means this and, and all of these things, but none of, the, none of them are actually concrete. No one looks at them and says, yep, that's the way that it is. That's the way that it goes. So we're, we're kind of stuck on behalf of, of okay, so we, we know that there will be this time. As it says, the abomination that causes desolation, there will be 1,290 days. And blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. So there will be this time. And, and if you reach the end of it, you will be blessed. But what exactly it's calling out to, how exactly we can understand it, is still a bit of a mystery for us. But I really want to look at the beginning of verse 11, because I view that actually as, as the important piece here. So the first thing that we actually see is the daily sacrifice abolished. And this is where the title of sacrifice actually came in, this, this daily sacrifice being abolished. If you're an Israelite, this doesn't make any sense to you. The daily sacrifice is a, a key component of your understanding and your faith or your belief since the day Israel began. In the book of Numbers is actually when we see this put in place. In chapter 28, verse 3, it says, Say to them, this is the food offering you are, present, are to present to the Lord. Two lambs, a year old, without defect, as a regular burnt offering each day. Offer one lamb in the morning and the other at twilight. And so they're being told that this offering, which was a key component, maybe, maybe let's say why, okay. So, so this was a key component because the priests offered the morning sacrifice, and this was to cleanse the priests, so that when they offered the evening sacrifice, they were cleansed as they offered a sacrifice on behalf of the rest of the Israelite people. And they did this because God had commanded it to them, and, and if we look deeper in that, we see there's a foundation of this animal sacrifice in, in everything we see from the day one in the Garden of Eden when God sacrificed animals to cover Adam and Eve's sin all the way until the New Testament when we see an ultimate sacrifice eventually coming. You see that when sin is present, a sacrifice is need to be made. There's a payment required for sin, always. And as we read in the New Testament, and as we see all throughout the Old Testament, that payment is death. On behalf of 